and these so many smiling faces looking at me. Um, welcome. I've just got a couple of announcements before Gemma takes over the welcome this morning. Um, potluck lunch today. It's the first Sabbath of the month, so yay. <laughs> so plenty of food. Um, don't be shy. Come on over and we'll spend some time together after the, after the worship. So yes, hopefully you can all come along. Um, tomorrow, have a very special day for the church. We're doing our family fun day in the car park out here. So we've um, got a lot of people involved. And if you're not specifically involved, come along anyway and, and support the day. Uh, it's a community day. And we're hopefully, um, we're going to get some, a lot of people come, come through the church uh, grounds. And we can um, have a bit of fun with them and, 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 and show them what we can do as a church community. On that, um, there is a preparation tonight, getting ready for tomorrow, uh, 6.30 in the hall, so we're going to do some decorations. If you've got some spare time, um, please consider that. Maybe come along and help us out. And also, I know a thank you has to go out. Someone anonymously has donated a lot of food for tomorrow, or has paid for a lot of the food. So whoever you are, we, we, we thank you. Um, Yes, we, we really appreciate that. Um, one final announcement, and these, these are all in the, uh, the newsletter, so if you've got that, you can refer to them later on. But um, how many people know Dearly Bloomfield? Yes, one of our dear old members for a, a long time. Dearly is turning 100 um, later on in this year, and so there's going to be made a little bit of fuss over her, and plans are going ahead. If you'd like to be a part of that, Please let Pam uh, Kerbaley know. I think she must have her hands in the, a lot of the organising and they would like to sort out numbers. So if you'd like to spend a, a Sunday, Sunday afternoon with Delia and friends and just celebrate her turning 100, just, just let Pam know and she can organise that. So thank you very much. Hello and welcome to the Bendigo Seventh-day Adventist Church this Sabbath morning. I hope you've all had a wonderful week and it's good to see you all. A special warm welcome to all the visitors with us today. I hope you all have a wonderful time with us. A welcome also to our regular visitors and a welcome to our local pastor, Pastor Daniel, who will be preaching today. As you may know, tomorrow is Father's Day, a day when we acknowledge all the fathers and all the men who have a positive influence in someone's life. I will now read a short poem in honor of Father's Day. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a sun of a sun, the calm quiet of a sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of eagle's flight, the joy of morning and spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family in need. And then God combined all these qualities. When there was nothing more to add, he knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it Dad. I would now like to ask some volunteers to come out and hand some small gifts on behalf of our church to all the men who have had a positive influence in our community. Thank you, Millie and Jed, for all of that. Oh. 
wonderful. Thank you, guys. It's now time for our first hymn, and we're going to sing What a Wonderful Saviour. It is now time for prayer and, and I'd just like to invite you where you are to, to kneel or, or bow your heads and let us approach the throne of God together. Our Lord, what a wonderful saviour you are. As, as we have sung, Lord, we just want to acknowledge you this morning for what you have done for us, what you are now doing for us and what you will continue to do for us for all eternity father we thank you lord that you are creator and you have you have given all of us life and lord this sabbath morning we want to celebrate that father i thank you for each person here this morning i thank you for those who have not made it as well lord and i just pray um, for each and every person uh, bowed here this morning lord we all have our trials and difficulties our, our problems from day to day and week to week but you are a good God and you ask us to bring those to you Lord and I just pray that this hour this this Sabbath morning that we can lay them at your feet and that we can feel the peace that comes from knowing you Jesus this world is in such a turmoil but you offer us hope you offer us joy of knowing you and the peace that comes with that, Father. And may we grab hold of that this morning. Lord, I pray for our speaker, Pastor Daniel, who will present um, the message this morning. I pray that we may be blessed by that. I pray that you will give him the words and the strength to present. Father, as a, as a church community, we, we uh, commit tomorrow to you as well, the, the fair day. 
Lord, we pray for success, but only as you would present it, Lord. We pray that um, for each person who is willing to give their time, we thank you for them, Lord, and we just pray for a successful day. We thank you for the weather tomorrow, Lord. You have blessed us with the sunshine. Lord, I pray throughout this week that we may make a difference to someone else. I pray that we may wear the name of Christian with honour, that we may be noted as one of yours with honour and, and pride. Lord, what it is, a wonderful thing to serve a mighty risen God. Lord, we look forward to the day when you return. We know that is soon. We look forward to that and we thank you for that, Lord. And we just pray that you would keep us um, on the right path. You would keep us true and straight and strong and focused on you in these times ahead. Father, thank you once again. We thank you that you love us and we will return that love to you as best we can, Father, in your loving name. Amen. Now time for the offering, so I'd just like to invite those allocated to come forth and collect, please. Now, Lord, we thank you once again for these, uh, these offerings and tithes that have been faithfully given. Father, we leave them in your mighty hand. We pray that you would multiply them as you see fit in your loving name. Amen. It's now time for our second hymn, and our hymn is Lift Him Up. Thank you. Three, seven, one.
children? It doesn't look like there are any. It looks like I'm giving an adult story. It's all right. There are people coming. <laughs> there are children coming. While the children are coming, they... Oh, hang on. Oh, I haven't turned it on. That's right. Oops. That was the first thing to do. Thank you. <laughs> I'll turn that on. Okay. I'm Renee and I'm a Sabbath school teacher. And I have no class in here. Oh, no, I've got a few students from Sabbath school in here. But while we're waiting... Oh, hang on. Oh, sorry. Would I be able to get the other children's story that was on the... So sorry, I forgot to tell you which one. I meant to delete the other one, sorry. I was thinking, oh, that looks different to... Whoops. With all the animals I have, while we're waiting for the children... There we go. Of all the animals... Thank you so much, Darren. Of all the animals I have, can anyone tell us what do you think today's story is about? Noah, that's a good guess. That was a great guess, actually. I wish I had done Noah now. That was, oh, well, no, I, was, I, have a, I have a theme today. We have some children. Come in, come in. You can sit on the chairs here if you want, if it's more comfortable. I don't have anything little to show you. Oh, can you do this, Arnie? No, he's out. Okay, little, the children's story. Benaya, honey, did you want to say, do you think, what do you think we're doing a children's story about? Oh, see, it's another Noah's Ark. Everyone's on a really good wavelength here, one that I wasn't on. It would have been nice, but this week, does anyone know what tomorrow is? Or for a lot of Adventists today, it's Father's Day. So we're doing a story about my dad. Oh, whoops. Nope, that's my mum. Sorry. Here we go. My dad. So my dad did something really special this year, and he walked me down the aisle. It was a very special day, and he's a very special dad. And as a Sabbath school teacher, a lot of the kids say, why do you love Jesus so much? Why are you so interested in Jesus? I have to say, my parents, they got me into Jesus. So we're going to go through a few ways that dad reminds me of God. But first of all, I might turn this off. We have an old photo. I was going to include a photo of both granddads. Both granddads, but this is the first year without one of my granddads. And I thought, if I do that, I'm going to cry and we won't get through it. Does anyone see my dad up there? Some of you know what my dad look like, looks like. He's in the second row. Can anyone pick which of these children? Dad's one of six. Darren knows. Yep. Yes, this spunk in the middle, that's my dad. That's my nana Darko and my granddad Darko. Nana Darko came from Norfolk Island and Grandad is German. So Dad is one of six. Only two of his siblings are in this picture, actually, because that's my Auntie Julene, my Auntie Neelene, Auntie Julene's husband, Dennis, and my Auntie Val, which I'm sure actually a lot of you will probably know because there's a lot of Darkos in Adventist churches <laughs> and we're all related. Now on to the story about Dad. My Dad is very kind and a lot of the stories I have especially them being kind, are to do with cars because we were always driving here, there and everywhere. And Dad, if he saw someone stopped or, stopped or their bus wasn't coming or there was an issue, guaranteed, it didn't matter where we were or what time, Dad would pull over and help them, made sure they were looked after and they got to the destination they wanted to go to. So I remember a lot of kindness from my dad. My dad is also very patient because you want to know something? When I was little... My mum worked night shift because she is a baby nurse. You know, she'd get the catching mitts and when the babies were born, she would catch them. She was one of those ones, right? She had to work night duty because apparently a lot of babies are born at night. They don't want to be born during the day, convenient times. No. So mum was always at night shift. And dad would have us. And dad would have us in bed by 8 o'clock. But every now and then at 7.55, I'd get up behind him and start rubbing his head. And my sister would start rubbing his feet. And the next thing he knew, he would be waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning and we'd be watching TV and there'd be cereal everywhere and we'd be having a great time. And one time, poor Dad fell asleep and he woke up with no eyebrows. Well, very few eyebrows because we found some hair removal cream when he fell asleep. So Dad is very patient and kind. So that's one thing about my dad. Another thing my dad is, can anyone tell me what this might be? He is fearless. Now, when I was about 20 years old, I had a job in the city 
and I was actually putting nurses in hospitals. And I didn't get home until really late with this job in the city. It was about one o'clock in the morning. And when I got home one night, I was walking out of the car and as I looked out of the car in the pitch black, I could hear someone work, walking towards me. And I got really scared and they started running towards me. So I ran up our stairs and I started bashing on the screen, on the sliding door. And mum and dad's room was really far away from the sliding door. And I couldn't, it was, I was so scared, it was pitch black, I couldn't get my keys, I dropped them. And I was just screaming for someone to let me in because I could hear someone running behind me and I could hear their breath even. Well, what I didn't realise is that dad didn't like, like to leave, sleep in the back room until I was home. So he was sleeping on the couch right near the sliding door. First thing he does, he turns on the light, throws open the sliding door and says, Honey, get the gun. Huh? What gun? He goes, Shh, whoever it is, they don't know we don't have a gun. Shh, get inside. And you know what? Those, tur those footsteps, they turn around and run away pretty quickly. So not only is he fearless, but he's, he's also very smart. And I have plenty of stories where my dad has been very fearless, including going surfing. He had to save us a few times surfing too. What do you think this is? <laughs> my dad is very strong. He is. Do you know what? Those jars with tough lids, they had no, nothing on dad, like no hope. My dad, he'd get any jar, just whoo, and it'd be open. The rest of us couldn't do it. And even now, if I fall asleep in a silly place, well, I haven't done it for a few years, but I had a disease where I'd fall asleep in funny places, he would still pick me up and carry me to bed. He's a very strong man, is my dad. Now, he's also lots of fun. He built us race cars. We used to drive race cars. He taught us how to ride our bikes and build tree houses and we spent a lot of time with that adventuring well, with mum and dad but today without dad so we'll just leave dad into it but grand my dad he's also very fun with the grandkids too and very loving see he is a husband to my mum and that's been 53 years <gasps> that's a long time and yet they still love each other <gasps> It's crazy. Not only that, he has been a wonderful dad to me and my sister. She's wonderful. You'll meet her one day, Elle. And he's very loving and obviously very forgiving, like when he woke up without the eyebrow. Very forgiving man. And he also is very loving towards his grandchildren. So he's got quite a, he's got four grandchildren now. You know Millie and Jed, and then they have two cousins named Jimmy and Tommy, and Grandad has been involved in every single part of their lives. He's very, very involved. So he sounds like a fantastic man, doesn't he? He's loving, he's kind, he's really fun. But the main thing that I love my dad for is because he taught me about the Bible. In between all those fun times, as well as during those fun times, because mum and dad were fantastic Pathfinder leaders, they taught me about Jesus and the Bible and that's what's made my life truly happy. So I will forever be thankful to my parents for being so loving and kind and for teaching me about Jesus because your life will always be better with Jesus in it, okay? So be thankful to your daddies because they are wonderful by bringing you here. Give them big kisses and cuddles and tell them how wonderful they are that they taught you about Jesus, okay? And have a really good Sabbath. Thank you, Renee. Wow. Are you embarrassed enough yet, Dennis? A little bit. Can I embarrass you by thanking you for the donation for the food as well? Oops. Just got to keep laying it on thicker and thicker, huh? You poor man. <laughs> All right. Let's pray and uh, we'll begin in just a moment. Father in heaven, I pray that this day we might uh, draw closer to you, and I pray that this might be a thing of joy, and I pray that you would uh, buoy us up in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Now, Manla, did you bring something? No, okay. I, was, I asked Manla to bring some little dumbbells because I thought maybe someone might want to fidget. And since we're talking about work today, maybe they, might, they could demonstrate for us what it's like to enjoy work. We'll do that another time. But what I have got is some nuts. Now, if you're allergic to nuts, you know what to do. Please don't take any. Uh, but if you're not allergic to nuts and you'd like a snack, on the theme of enjoying work and exercise and all that kind of thing, we ha have something like a little trail mix uh, in a little bag for you. So that's just being handed out. What do you enjoy? What do you enjoy? Maybe you enjoy exercise. I never have, but Mandla does. There's going to be some exercise tomorrow, isn't there, Mandla? Yeah, so it's not just going to be fun and games. There's going to be some hard work as well. No, fun work, fun work, exercising as well. If you want to hold on to the nuts till tomorrow to eat, at the, you can do that too, but otherwise feel free to snack on them now. Cashews and almonds, just so that you know, in case you're allergic to either of those. And sultanas, is, do people get allergic to sultanas? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> what do you enjoy? What do you enjoy? Life. It's good. Travel. Did you say thinking widely? Reading the Bible. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, someone asked me once, what do you do for fun? In the context of you don't drink and you don't do this and you don't do that. What do you do for fun? I said reading the Bible and he shook his head. Weirdo. <laughs> it's true. Let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and starting in verse 11. Different people do different things for fun. I didn't expect anyone to, to say this one, but when I point it out, maybe some of you will be like, oh yeah, okay. Luke 19, 11 to 26, we're going to read. Luke 19, 11 to 26. Now, I ducked out for a bit. Did we have this read at some point? No, okay. I'll read it myself. Luke 19, 11 to 26. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten miners, and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your miner has earned ten miners. And he said to him, Well done, good, good servant. Because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your miner has earned five miners. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your miner, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you do not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the miner from him and give it to him who has ten miners. But they said to him, Master, he has ten miners. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And the next verse goes on to talk about the punishment. Now, what do we learn from this story? It's a strange story, isn't it? Did you know this is based on a true story. A lot of Jesus' parables are kind of... I don't know how much the others are based on true stories, but 
you know, like the Good Samaritan and the, the sons. I don't know if there were actual Good Samaritans and actual sons that Jesus was referring to. But this story we know from history is a true story. We know it actually happened at the time of Christ. Uh, one of the Herods, one of the Herods, there are a few of them, inherited one of the kingdoms around Jerusalem, that area, right? And in order to get his kingdom, who did he have to go to? Was Herod a real sovereign king with his own independent empire? That's right. They, they were under the empire of Rome, right? So they were client kings. They were lesser kings. Um, and Herod had to go to the emperor to claim his kingdom. So when Jesus says in verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return, everyone knew exactly who he was talking about. Herod. Now, word association, Herod. What words do you associate with Herod? Mean. Great. Okay, there was one of them that wasn't him. What else? <laughs> what else do you associate with Herod? Power hungry, death, yes, death giving it and receiving it from God, yep. Murdering children. Most of it not very positive, except the great bit, but once again, that was a different one. So, even the great one was not very positive. Everyone knew who this was talking about. Did they like this man or not like him? What do you think? Well, the clue is in the next... Uh, in, in two verses from there, verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. And we know from history that that happened. Right? There was a delegation of Jews particularly who went to Rome and spent some time and, and money and effort to try to stop this man being their king. They came up with legal precedents. They, they bribed officials. They did all sorts of things to the point where it was recorded in history that this happened. They did not want this man to be their king. So, all in all, not a very likable person. And then you have some servants. Servants who are working for this not very liked king. And it's the servants that we're supposed to focus on here, right? So what kind of servants were there? One of them was given, oh, there were 10 of them, they were each given one minor. Now, a minor, in the King James Bible, I think it says pound. Is that right? A pound. Now, what I really like about the King James Bible is that back in those days, they were actually trying to translate everything into English. Whereas now, we Christians in the, in the church are so well educated in our Greek and Hebrew and in our ancient history that they don't even bother translating anymore. They just say minor, as if I'm supposed to know what that means, right? It's like someone who's digging for gold. Is that, is that what it means? No, it, it basically means a pound. Now, a pound in Old English is referring to a pound of what? Silver pennies. All right, so 240 pennies in a pound, is that right? Come on. We got some people who remember before decimalization. Is it right or no? Right, okay. So if you multiply that out, I think it comes to 240 pennies in a pound. Now, if you actually physically weigh 240 pennies, how much do you think it might weigh? A pound. Right, that's where the word comes from. But this concept goes way back. It came into English from William the Conqueror. Um, but it goes way back to Roman times. So in Roman times, they had essentially the same system as what we used to have in this country before decimalization. That's why it's called the imperial system. And a, a, a penny, a penny was actually the same word as another word you might have heard before, but it starts with D. A denarius. Now, the short form of denarius was deni, as in denarii, like it was a short, short form, deni. So if you were writing 
you know, how many denarius you were giving someone, you'd say five denny, right? Which is why it's a D. And if you look at the old system, the symbol for pennies is what letter? Does anyone know? It's a D. And that's where it comes from, right? So the original word was denarius, but it became the word penny. Now, these days, we think of a penny as like a cent. Now, how, how much bread can you buy with a cent? Not much. Right. The inflation has, has killed it ever since they went away from the gold and silver, right? But back when a, a piece of silver was, you know, a cent was actually a piece of silver, how much could you buy with a penny? A fair bit. A fair bit. In fact, back in Roman times, a denarius was a, basically the minimum wage. They didn't have a minimum wage technically, but it was like the low-level lo, low wage, daily wage, was a denarius. So I know that's a bit of a long explanation, but that's what a minor is. It's 240 days wages. It's a, a pound of denariuses. It is not a fortune. There is a similar parable where each servant is given a small fortune. In this case, they're just given, well, how much these days, oh, inflation, inflation's killing us. Let's say $30,000. Is that, is that too much? Is that roughly 240 days wages, r less than a year's wage? 30000 something like that. It's, it's a fair bit of money, but it's not a fortune. And what are they to do with this money? grow it. The king's not giving it to them out of charity. He's not giving it to them for them to spend. He's giving it to them to make more money. So what, how do they respond? Well, one of them, maybe the one a bit, you know, maybe not so into the whole uh, money thing, manages to make quite a bit more money, actually. Five Five uh, compared to one. That's a really good return on investment, isn't it? In how long? Maybe this guy was pretty good with money. I don't know what he was doing with it. And another one makes ten times as much. That's incredible. I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but this story immediately follows the story about Zacchaeus. So I don't know if these guys were collecting taxes with that money. But what about the third one that's mentioned? What does he do with the money? Yeah, seems like a reasonable thing to do. I'm sure plenty of you are doing that too. Although inflation is going to make it worth nothing, so maybe you better not. He puts it in a handkerchief and hides it. Why does he do that? What is the reason that he gives why he does that? Is it because he doesn't know how to invest? Why does he hide the money? Fear. Fear. Interesting. Now, how many of these servants do you think feared Herod? All of them. Which of them feared Herod the most? I don't know. May, maybe the one that buried the stuff? I don't know. Maybe the one who made the tent? I don't know. It's a bit hard to say. Which of these three servants do you think was the happiest? When, when he, they were given that money to invest, which of them do you think was like, this is finally the opportunity that I've been given. I've been wanting to do this for a long time and now finally I've been given something and now I want to go and I want to, and want to invest it. Spoiler, it wasn't the last one, right? The last one had a fear of Herod, but he was missing something else, wasn't he? What was he missing? Sorry? Money. Maybe. It doesn't, doesn't imply that particularly. He may have been a master, uh, master stockbroker. I don't know. What was he missing? A motivation. But isn't fear the best motivator? 
What is fear a good motivator for? It's a good motivator to do something. But it's not a good motivator to do highly challenging, risky processes, right? They've done psychology experiments on cockroaches. So if you want to be compared to a cockroach, get ready for it. <laughs> the reason they did it to cockroaches was because they were testing which is more powerful, the pain incentive, the fear of pain, or the desire for gain. And they found that in some circumstances, the pain was more powerful. Like, for example, if the cockroach had to run in a straight line, and if they didn't run fast enough, they would zap them. So they would run very fast to get away from danger. But put the same cockroach in a maze, doesn't matter how many times you zap that cockroach, it won't get through the maze any faster. In fact, it might even get through slower if you're inflicting it with pain. But you put a treat at the end, then the cockroach will get through the maze faster. Now, I would suggest that in that sense, we are like cockroaches. Sorry if that offends you. We are also more motivated by a desire for something good than we are by a fear of pain. That's not to say that there are some circumstances where we aren't more motivated by pain. But in this story, every single one of these people that the king was being cruel to was afraid of him already. Every one of these people feared what the king might do to them. And yet the results were so different. Maybe the difference was that some of those servants actually liked making money. So does anyone here like making money? <laughs> Maybe some do. And that's okay. So are we asking the wrong question sometimes? Maybe instead of asking the question, do I fear God enough? Maybe if you're even asking that question, you do. Maybe we should be asking the question, do I love God enough? Or am, am I enjoying God enough? Or am I enjoying life enough? What is stealing my joy? I decided to preach on joy this week, and maybe that was a mistake, because all week I've been challenged to practice what I preach by all sorts of little things just coming in to annoy me, right? So let that be a warning if you ever preach on something. Make sure you preach on something that the opposite to happen will be a good thing. No, maybe not. You know, just little things. Jam my finger. Got a sore foot whatever, right? Lots of little things happening. But I've been challenged. And as I've been reflecting and preparing this, this sermon, I've been challenged to think, what, what is, where do I really get my joy? Where does it really come from? And I remember a time, I, I mentioned to you maybe last week, about how I asked God to give me love for people. And he did. And it didn't make me happy. And it didn't make me happy because it gave me a new reason to be sad. Because now I had a love for all these people who were lost. And not just lost, I believe that they would be condemned to an eternal torment in hell. So how can you be happy? believing that? How can you have joy knowing that so many people are destined for such infinite suffering? It wasn't easy. It was quite challenging. In fact, it was more than I could manage. And we had a little competition in, in Air Force Cadets where you had to stand to attention, not move, and everyone else would try to make you laugh or smile or move in some way. And I, was, I always ruled those competitions. I was the king of being sad. And the way that I won was I simply just thought of all these people trying to make me laugh 
going to hell. That's miserable. No wonder I couldn't win anyone to Christ. That was another thing that made me sad. Every time I tried to convert someone, arguing with them, explaining to them why they were wrong about things, it didn't work. It didn't matter how many good arguments I had. It didn't work. Maybe it's because I myself wasn't living the life that God wants us to live. Maybe it's because I myself hadn't yet found joy that I wasn't able to witness. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Because Jesus had quite a different motivation. Jesus was driven by a very different force. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews, by the way, is uh, just after the letters of Paul or just before the letters of not Paul because we're not sure whether it's his letter or not. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What motivated Jesus? What does it say? For the pain? For the suffering? For the sadness about all the people that were lost? I have no doubt that Jesus is sad about those who were lost. And I am too. But is that what drove him? Is that what motivated him? When I was exposed to biblical arguments showing that the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death and that death is final and that Jesus actually paid the full penalty of death on the cross, that a a complete death and separation from God is the dreaded punishment that we want to avoid. The question in my mind and, and those who were arguing, trying to persuade me against that, was won't people then sin if they know that hell's not that bad? All it is is separation from God. All it is is ending life for eternity. It's not that bad. Maybe, maybe people will sin. Maybe people will not turn to God because hell's not so bad. Hell's not so hot, as they say. And I occasionally see uh, presentations making, making the case and saying, The good news about hell, whoopee, it only means separation from God. That's fantastic news. Maybe you can sense that I don't fully subscribe to that. I tried to make the case to someone once, and he said, what I believe sounded just as bad. In fact, a friend of mine made the case to a, 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 a man in prison once, And he was devastated. He said, that's so much worse than I thought it was. I thought I got to live in hell and and hang out with other people. What you're telling me is that it's the end. That, That that's it. So is hell good news? Did you know there are people who take their own lives that believe that doing so will guarantee they go to hell. I don't believe that. But there are people that do that. Why? Is hell really something that God does to us? Or is it something that we do to ourselves? Is it what we do to ourselves when we lose touch with God? When we lose touch with each other, with our family, with our friends? Is hell something that we all go through, even now? Now, I don't want to go through that for eternity. And I don't want you to either. I don't want anyone to. So there is a, there is a motivation there. But what was the motive that drove Jesus. 
what was the thing that he lived by? What was the thing that as, as people who are here to copy Jesus and to follow Jesus, we are to live by? Love, joy, peace, patience, etc. Joy. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now, what was that joy? Streets of gold? Jesus loves him some golden concrete. He's a builder. I suppose he does, but was that the joy? Was it being restored to communion with the Father? Why then did he willingly choose to forego that, if that was his joy, for which he endured the cross? Was he simply wanting to be in communion with the Father? He had that already. Who was he wanting to be in communion with? You. It was for you that Jesus not only endured the cross, but he laughed at the pain, at the shame of the cross. It was like nothing to him compared to the joy of being reconciled to you. So, what about you? What, where do you get your joy? Where does your joy come from? If Jesus comes into your life, what kind of a joy is he offering to you? Streets of gold? Golden concrete? Oh, we love that golden concrete. A mansion in heaven? Is that, you know, if you're really good, you'll get the better mansion. Is that the reward? Is that what you're living for now? Are you living and working now for the joy of having a bigger house, a better car? Does that give you joy? Does it fill you with joy? What filled Jesus with joy? Having a bigger house? Jesus went from the biggest house in the universe to no house at all. Why? Was he sadistic? He just liked to hurt himself? Why did he do that? Was he miserable because he made this great sacrifice? Was he joyful? He had joy because he knew that by making that tiny little sacrifice, all the wealth in the universe was a tiny little sacrifice so he could be reconciled to you. So when we come to Christ, are we miserable? Are we miserable because maybe someone else will miss out? Are we miserable because maybe we'll miss out on some of the, some of the goodies that we might have had? If we'd been dishonest, maybe we'd, we could have stolen some more money than we did. Maybe we could have gone to jail, maybe not, I don't know. Are we miserable because we've lost that? Are we miserable because we've lost, I can do whatever I want? Or do we have joy? Are you enjoying your life's work? Maybe... You've got a boring job. Is that a bad thing? No. You know, the fall, the curse, right? The curse of work is that the very best thing you can hope for is a boring job. Because jobs are either dangerous or boring. They're, they're exhausting, taxing. They, they really suck the life out of you. Or they're just boring. Oh, I just got a boring job. I sit behind a desk. I work at a computer. Or, yeah, I got electrocuted last week in my job. That's not boring. But is that your life's work? Is that what you live for? You could have the, the very height, the very pinnacle. What's the pinnacle of work today? What do the young people all want to be? Mattress tester. That sounds like your, your dream job, Renee. That's an adult's dream job. No, the kids want to be streamers or uh, like influencers or paramedics, right? 
that sounds like fun. Although there's a lot of burnout in paramedic. Right? If you can do it, God bless you. But it takes a lot of, takes a lot of emotional strength to do that job. Right? So do you have to have a job like that to have a life work that gives you joy? What is your life work? What is your life work? What are you living for? For your job? For your boss? Maybe when you die, your boss will come to your funeral. Maybe when when you're sick, your boss will come and pat your hand and say it's okay. Is your boss like that? I'm not even sure my boss would do that. Maybe, actually. Maybe. What's your life work? What, what did we hear before? Oh, I was in Sabbath school. Mothers give their lives to their children every day and to their husbands, building them up, making them greater people. We all need it. And fathers, in their own way, do the same, as we heard about being patient, having fun, learning to have fun. What a skill. What a skill. And tomorrow I hope that you can join us as we strive to have fun, to have joy. God may well have something in mind for you. And yes, it may be family. There may be something else as well. A life work, something to give you joy, something to give you meaning. Talk to God about that. The prayer I'm asking you to make, and if you've got your name tag, we'll be sticking them on a poster at the back. Just sometime between the final prayer and uh, when, when you leave, we're going to go over and have, have the potluck. Dear Jesus, please give me a work I enjoy. Thank you. Amen. And that's it. That's my prayer. You don't need to worry about anything else from this sermon. Make that your driving motivation. May God give you joy in your work, joy in serving him, joy in obeying him, joy in doing what's right. I don't want to have to be scared into doing what's right because I know that it won't work. What I want is to have a taste of the joy of doing the will of God. And there is no greater joy than that. Let's pray, and then we'll have our final hymn. Our Father in heaven, I do pray that you would give each one of us the joy of your work. I pray that for each of us here, you would take away any fear that would prevent us from knowing you, preventing us from loving you. Drive that away, Lord. And fill us instead with the joy of knowing what it really means to be in harmony with you, with Christ, with each other, with our families. Lord, I know that each one has a choice and some people will choose not to love, not to share in this communion. It is sad. It is tragic. But Lord, I know that you love them even more than we do. And I pray that you would touch them somehow and may our lives touch the loved ones of others that we might all have a chance to be together again when you come. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing joyfully, seeking the lost. Darren and Manla, please come in and help.
your spirit would be in us, that we would with joy go and seek the lost, cheer them and bring them to the joy that only you can give us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.